and we are excited about what God has in store for us. And uh, we just uh, can't wait for the Lord to, uh, uh, to just speak to us this morning. We want to prepare our hearts for worship, and our choir is going to get us started. So, so you just prepare for God to, to speak to you this morning. excited about what God has to do in our midst this morning. I want to call your attention to a few announcements this morning. Um, our students are doing a top golf event this afternoon and this evening, so they'll be leaving at 2 o'clock. If you have a student, we certainly want you to feel free to participate in that. And then our Wednesday night events, make sure that you come for Wednesday night Bible study, uh, youth worship, as well as children activities. We certainly want you to come and be a part of that. As we continue in prayer this morning, Doug Moore is going to come and lead us in an opening prayer. Just praying for our country and for our church family during these unusual times. Let us pray. Father God, we love you so much, Lord. We just praise your name. Again, Lord, we we ask a special blessing on our country, Lord. We know this is the greatest nation on this earth, Lord. It was founded on the day of Christian beliefs, Lord. We just, we know that we've drifted away from you over the years, Lord. We pray that our country will turn back to you, Lord, before, before it's too late, Lord. There's so much to sin, so many problems in this country. We pray for, for people that are suffering right now there, Lord, in big cities and other places, Lord. We just pray that we'll somehow unify us, Lord. We know that only through you, Lord, as Christians, Christians, that we can really turn this country around. We pray for the lost, Lord, that they'll heed your call to do that, Lord, get back to where we belong as Christian brothers and sisters. We pray for our church, too, Lord, and his staff as we fight through this coronavirus, Lord, this pandemic that's sweeping the, our country, that's sweeping the whole world, Lord. We pray for for vaccines, we pray for our doctors and scientists, Lord, as they try to develop them. We pray that one will come quick, Lord. We pray for those that are sick right now with this coronavirus. Lord, we say a special prayer for our brother Walter Van Sant. Lord, we, there's no better Christian on this earth than this man, Lord. He's, he's, he's meant so much to me in my walk, too, Lord, and I know so many others, Lord, that Walter has touched their lives. We pray for him as he, he battles through this, this coronavirus right now in the hospital, Lord. Pray that you'll be with the doctors to help help guide them through this trial of times, Lord. Again, Lord, we just thank you for all you've done for us. We thank you for your many, many blessings. All these things we ask in the holy and precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. During these uncertain times, you know, the best thing we can do as Christians is put our life in the hands of God and rely on Him for strength for health, for power, and for victory in this world. And we're going to point our worship in exactly that vein. Will you stand with us as we begin with My Life is a You. Is 
Father, we thank you for providing the Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, to show us the way out of the darkness. Father, to wash us in his precious blood, to redeem us and draw us to you. And Father, reconcile that relationship that we can build our life on and trust in you for strength and power and victory over the darkness of this world. Remind us, Father, where it all starts. And that starts with us giving our lives, our hearts, to Jesus Christ and believing that he is the Son of God. In that one act, you deliver us, Father, from everything that would bind us, from everything that would separate us, from everything, Father, that would discourage us and defeat us in this world. Remind us of that daily, and may we dedicate ourselves to living and sharing that message of Jesus Christ with everyone we come in contact. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior.
Well, thank you, choir, for that wonderful word and song this morning. This morning we continue our journey through uh, the New Testament book of Hebrews. We come to Hebrews chapter 11, one of the best loved chapters in all the Bible, Hebrews 11, as we talk about radical faith this morning. And our key verse is from Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6. We can get that up there. Let's, let's read it aloud together. Without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So we begin this morning with a question. Do you want to please God? Do you really want to please God? Do you want God's hand of blessing upon your life? Do you want God to smile upon you? Do you want God to look at your life and say, this is my child with whom I am well pleased? Do you really and truly want to please God? I think there's very little indication in most people's lives today that, that they really want to please God. Some people want to please God some of the time, but what they really want more than anything else is to please others. To please other people. They want to please others and be approved by their peers so that they can feel better about themselves. Some people live to please others. That's what their life is all about. Others live to please themselves. They look out for number one. They want to get all they can in life. All the possessions that they can. All the power. All the pleasures all the toys, all the success, all the things that make them look good and powerful in the eyes of the world. Life is all about them and their self-absorbed obsession. There's a small minority of people in the world who really want to please God. If you want to please God, there's only one way to do it according to Scripture. You can't please God by rules, by rituals, or by religion. You can only please God through a relationship with Him that is based upon faith in Christ. So, what is faith? Well, faith is the belief that God is, according to Hebrews here in this verse that we just read. To believe that there is a God who made the world and everything in it, including myself, including you. And that he has a purpose for my life. He has a direction that he wants me to, to go in my life. He, uh, he, 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 he has secured my past, my present, and my future. And I'm safe in his hands. Not only that, but you believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He's a kind and generous and gracious God who always gives much more to us than we could ever give back to him. He gave us life. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us the hope of eternal life. He rewards us now and he will reward us on the day of judgment. Here's another question. How do you know if your faith is real? How do you know if you have a real, genuine kind of faith or whether it's some kind of a, a counterfeit faith, a phony faith? Do you know how the authorities detect counterfeit money? They test it and they examine it closely, often under a microscope, and they compare it to the real thing to see if it really measures up. To find out if your faith is real and genuine, God allows it to be tested. That's why Abraham is considered the, the ultimate example of faith, because his faith was tested again and again. And that's not only true for Abraham, but it's been true for every believer of Christ down through the ages. Look at this verse from 1 Peter 1, verse 7. He says, The purpose of trials is to prove that your faith is genuine. Even gold is tested by fire. And so your faith, which is much more precious than gold, must also be tested so that it may endure. Then you will receive praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed. When I was growing up, 
I used to love to eat Pop-Tarts in the morning. Breakfast of champions, right? Any of you like, like Pop-Tarts? Uh, not supposed to eat them anymore, but when I was a kid, man, I loved Pop-Tarts. And I'd get up and get ready for school, and I'd put a couple of Pop-Tarts in the toaster. Push that button down. And in a few moments, you know, they'd pop up, and they'd be just warm and delicious and crunchy and sugary and you know, n nothing like starting your day out on a sugar high, right? But every now and then, those Pop-Tarts would pop up before they were ready. You know, if I didn't have it set just right, they'd pop up too quick and they wouldn't get good and warm. So I'd have to push them back down again, let them get a little warmer before they were ready to eat. When we go through the heat of life and things get uncomfortable for us, we go through adversity, we go through a fiery trial. What's the first thing we do? We cry out to God, God, get me out of here. Pop me up, Lord. Get, get me out of this mess. Get me out of this uncomfortable position that I'm in because, Lord, it's, it's getting too hot. It's getting too uncomfortable for me. Lord, get me out of this. Deliver me. That's our prayer, isn't it? And that's, that's our humanity that's coming out. We don't like to be uncomfortable. We don't like to go through adversity. We don't like to be tested and tried. But sometimes God has to push us back down a little longer. And he says to us, you're not quite ready. I've got some things in store for you. And I'm preparing you for greater things. And I'm, I'm trying to develop your character. I'm trying to help you to be more and more Christ-like in your nature, and I'm not quite ready for you yet. You know, to, to fully understand chapter 11 of Hebrews, the great faith chapter, we really have to, to go back a, a few verses, about six verses, to chapter 10 and verse 34. The situation was that some of these believers had been put in jail, and those not put in jail were faced with the crisis of whether or not uh, to go underground, to become secret disciples that nobody else knew about, or to just to publicly identify with the church and put themselves at risk along with their life and property. And this is what happened. Look at that verse in Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 34. You showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. They had their property taken away knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. So the book of Hebrews was written to create this kind of people. Um, uh, those not put in jail were, were faced with a crisis. And, and, and so they had to have faith. They had to have a strong, genuine, radical kind of faith. And so Hebrews was written to, to encourage people to consider the consequences of their radical faith. That it might cost you. It might cost you your property. It might cost you your reputation. It might cost you your very life. And this is why Hebrews was written, to develop and encourage these kind of people who could stand strong during the fiery trials of life. People who were willing to risk their property and their life to bring glory to God and love to others. People who, who don't look to their own comforts and ease and safety. People who are free from the love of leisure and wealth and security. People who know that there is one life to live and what is done in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord and for the good of others is all that matters and all that will last. Hebrews 10, 34 is clear how this comes about. He says, because you knew that you had better and lasting possessions. In other words, you have a hope that something better is coming. And this hope is, is in a better future is the power that releases people to live lives of radical faith and love. So faith is the key. Faith unleashes us from the love of things which makes us self-centered. And Hebrews 11 is written to illustrate the nature of faith 
and the people of faith. It tells us what faith is and what it looks like in a person's life. It tells us, uh, he gives us this long litany of different people who lived by faith, like Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and on and on it goes. So today, let's look at the example of Abraham. And let's see four characteristics of a radical faith that changes the world around us. Number one, people with radical faith do things that can't be explained without God. They do things that can't be explained without God. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 8. By faith Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance obeyed and went even though he did not know where he was going so God comes to Abraham and he says Abraham I want you to pack up and move I've got a different plan for you and this was difficult for Abraham for a number of reasons first of all Abraham was an old man at this time he was 75 years of age. That doesn't sound nearly as old as it used to when I read this passage, but Abraham was 75, and he was ready to kind of retire, hang it up, take it easy for a while. And the Lord came to Abraham and said, hey, Abraham, i got a whole new plan for you. It's not time for you to sit back and, and rest just yet. I've got places for you to go and things for you to do that are going to change the world. So buckle up and hang on because you're about to go places and do things that you could never imagine. Not only was Abraham an older man at this time, but he was also a very wealthy man. He lived in Ur of the Chaldees. I laugh every time I see that name. It's like somebody asks you where you're from. Ur, Ur. It's like you're not sure where you're from. Yeah, where were you born? Ur. Where'd you grow up? Ur. Uh, but he lived in Ur of the Chaldees. And archaeologists tell us that this was a beautiful metropolitan area back in the day. The wealth of the world was kind of centered there. Abraham was well off. He was very comfortable. He had plenty of cattle and sheep and 50 servants. Wow, that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? He was a wealthy man, but there were no allied van lines at that time. And when he relocated, he had to take all that stuff with him. And on top of that, the big thing here is that God didn't tell him exactly where he was going. I mean, that, that's kind of tough, isn't it? I mean, the Lord says, okay, pack up and move, but I'm not going to tell you where you're going until you get there. I'll let you know when you get there. Would you go under those circumstances? The Bible says that Abraham obeyed and went. That's what faith does. Faith obeys the voice of God, even when we don't understand it. So there were no excuses, no hesitation. He just obeyed. Let's apply that to where we are today. God may be asking some of you to make a real change in your life. Change is never easy. The longer I live, the more I dislike change. I dislike things the way they are, you know. I mean, why change things up if it's going good, right? But uh, it's uncomfortable. And sometimes you have to ask the where question. Lord, where should I work? Lord, where do you want me to live? Where do, should I go to school? Where should I find a job? Where should I serve you, Lord? Where do you want me to be? God is saying, be obedient, and I will direct you. And so one of the tests of our faith sometimes is the test of change. Where does God want us to go? Where does he want us to serve him? Genuine, radical faith says, I'm going to do things that can't be explained without God. I'm going to strive to please him and not everybody else. A second mark of those with a genuine, radical kind of faith is to hold on to the promises of God's word. Those with radical faith hold on to the promises of God's holy word. Look at Hebrews 11 verse 9. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder 
is God. The key word here is promise. God wants us to base our lives on the promise of God's holy word. God promised Abraham, if you move, I'll give you the land of Israel, the promised land. But the problem is that after he got there, there was a delay. And Abraham lived a hundred more years, and he kept waiting and waiting for God to deliver on this promise. He lived in tents during this time. Now, how would you like to live in a tent, okay? I know a lot of people live in campers nowadays, but how would you like to live in a tent? I mean, that'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? But, but he never settled down. He was constantly on the move, and this went on for the next three generations. Abraham, uh, you know, probably started every prayer with, with when, Lord, when? How long is this going to last? When are you finally going to make good on your promise? When are you going to answer my prayers? When are you going to fulfill your promise? When are you going to meet my needs, Lord? Now, I don't know about you, but I handle problems a lot better when there's a definite time limit on that you know when you can see the light at the end of the tunnel then you know hey I can make it a little bit longer when you know the deadline's coming up I, I can make it that much longer but when it's indefinite when you don't know how much longer it's going to last it's tough that takes more faith doesn't it some of you are in this test right now the test of when when Lord when am I going to get a job when are we going to have a baby? Lord, when is my marriage going to get better? When am I going to get that promotion? When am I ever going to get well, Lord? When? What are you expecting God to do right now that he's not fulfilled yet in your life? How long can you wait for an answer to prayer? That's one of the biggest tests of our faith right there. How long can you wait for God to answer a prayer? It takes faith, doesn't it? I mean, a baby wants it right now. That's why he cries out, I want it now. I want to be fed now. I want my diaper changed right now. And sometimes, as immature believers, we want it right now. But maturity is able to wait upon the Lord. And if you look at all the giants of the faith, Abraham, Noah, Moses, they all had to wait upon the Lord. It didn't happen overnight. If you've ever read the book of Psalms, over and over again, it says, wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. There's no more frustrating place in the world than to be in God's waiting room. You know, any waiting room's tough, right? When you're sitting in the waiting room at the doctor's office, it's not a pleasant place. Sitting at the waiting room in the hospital, not a pleasant place. Sitting in the waiting room in the garage, waiting for your car to get fixed. Whatever, you're just, you're waiting and waiting and waiting. But to be put in God's waiting room is tough. It's difficult. It's not easy. It takes a lot of faith. And the key is to remember the promises of God's word. And to remember that God has never broken a promise. He always fulfills his promise in the end. How long can you wait? People of radical faith hold on to the promises of God's word. Thirdly, people of radical faith expect God to do what only he can do. You expect God to do what only he can do. Hebrews 11, verse 11. By faith, even Sarah who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. God promised Abraham that he would be the father of a great nation. There was just one problem with that. Abraham was 99 years old, and, and Sarah was almost as old as he, and God promised that he would be the father of this great nation. And uh, we know that we're told that Sarah laughed, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Abraham didn't laugh. I'm not sure if I heard that news when I was 99. I might cry instead of laughing. I'm not sure. But uh, that, that was tough, you know, interesting news. But God had the last laugh. Because Isaac was born, whose name means laughter. Now, some of you 
a word sick right now because you've got an impossible problem and you don't know how it's going to turn out and you're afraid and you're not necessarily asking where or when but maybe you're asking how how Lord how am I going to make ends meet this month Lord how am I going to handle this pressure that I'm under right now how am I going to get out of this debt that I'm in how are you going to change my husband's attitude or how are you going to bring my wife back or Lord how are you going to get through to my son or daughter who's gone astray Lord how how can I trust God's providence without knowing how he's going to do it it's called living by faith and it's a, it's a revolutionary idea for most people. It's just living a life of trusting God. And, you know, faith is expecting God to do what only He can do. So what are you expecting from God right now? God may not always answer our prayers exactly the way we pray them. But God has said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to meet your needs. So what are you expecting from God? Some of us go all the way through life and we're without ever expecting anything from God. If you're not expecting anything from God, you're not really living by faith, are you? So what are you expecting God to do? You know, when we come to church on Sunday morning and we gather to study His Word and we gather to worship the Lord together, we ought to come with a spirit of expectation that the Lord's going to speak to me today. There ought to be a, a sense of excitement about that. God, what, what do you have for me today? What wisdom do you have? What, what encouragement do you have? What, what promise do you have from your word for me this very day? These are gifts from Almighty God. But we often miss them because we don't really expect anything from him. We just kind of come with a negative hangdog attitude like nothing's going to happen, you know. And I'm just struggling my way through life. Faith is expecting something from the living God. The Bible says in Genesis 18, is anything too hard for the Lord? And the answer is no. Nothing's too hard from Him. So how big is your God? Most of us don't have a big faith because we don't really believe in a big enough God. How big is your God? People of radical faith expect God to do what only He can do. Number four, trust God when it doesn't make sense. People of radical faith are willing to trust God even when it doesn't make sense. And this causes us to ask the why question. There, there's a lot in the world that doesn't make sense. And I don't know why God allows all the things that he does. I don't know why God allows all the evil that he does. I know that he, you know, God doesn't have to allow bad things to happen to good people. He can just, he can just take away our ability to choose, right? Because we're all sinful, broken people living in a broken world. And, 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 and our decisions often lead us in the wrong direction sometimes. There's, there's so much that doesn't make sense. But... Um, God has to allow us to make our own choices and, and he has to allow the consequences of those choices. Notice what he says in Hebrews 11 beginning in verse 17. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had, who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so, in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Now, this is probably one of the, the stories that people question, skeptical people question this more than any other story in the Bible almost. Uh, often, you know, after Isaac, the, the miracle child, had grown up, he was maybe 12 or 14 by this time probably, God says, okay, I want you to sacrifice Isaac to me. 
There's no precedent for this in the Bible, and Abraham certainly didn't understand it. Um, Isaac represented everything that God had given to Abraham, all the promises. And so our response is shock. You know, how could God even ask this? But, but look at Abraham's confidence here. The Bible says he reasoned, he, he thought things out, and he concluded that, you know, God has the right to make any demand upon my life that he wants to because I belong to him. I'm his servant, right? He made me, he created me, he put me here. So God has the right to, to ask anything, to make any demand upon my life. God is God and I'm not. And uh, so, therefore, everything that I have, everything that I ever will have, I owe to God. So whatever demand that the God makes, I have no right to disobey him. And on top of that, Abraham figured that if God could give him a miracle son at 100 years of age, then certainly he could raise him from the dead if he so chose. So it becomes this, this precursor, so to speak, of the resurrection of Christ. So faith is trusting God's purpose without knowing why? Some of you are going through this test right now. And it's, it's the toughest of all, the why, isn't it? Why did I lose my job, Lord? Been working faithfully all these years. Walk in one day, get a pink slip. Why, Lord? Why did I lose my job? Why was my mates unfaithful to me? Why did we have a miscarriage? Why did my loved one have to die? Why am I sick all the time? There's nothing wrong with asking these questions of God, but how do you respond when the answer doesn't come immediately? How do, how do you answer when you don't have all the answers to life's problems? God doesn't give any explanation here to Abraham. He just said, follow me. Trust me, and I will provide for you. And Abraham trusted God without any explanation at all. Faith goes beyond the realm of explanations. Faith goes beyond the realm of having all the answers. If you have figured out all the hows and whys and wheres of life, then you don't, you don't need faith, right? If you have all the answers, you don't need faith. You know, the key to passing a human test is having all the right answers. But the key to passing God's test is not knowing the answers, but knowing the Lord and trusting Him. I did something the other day that I've never done before in my 60 years of life. A friend invited me to go flying with him. He's a pilot. And for the first time in my life, I rode in a little single-engine prop plane. Now, I'm a cautious kind of guy, okay? I'm not, I, I don't, I'm not a high-risk kind of guy. I don't, I don't do that. But I was willing to go with confidence. Why? Because I knew the pilot because I trusted him. I knew his experience. I knew his manner. I knew that he was a safe person, and I felt safe with him, and I trusted him. You know, the key to trusting God is knowing God. The better we know him through faith in Christ, and the, mo the better we know his word and his will and his plan for our lives, the more we're able to trust him with our whole life life with all of our questions and all of our uncertainties and all of our doubts we can trust him because we know him because he has revealed himself to us so here's the question for you this morning what is it in your life right now that you need to trust to God's care we all have some uncertainties. We all have questions that we don't have the answers to. What do you need to do to fully trust God with your whole life, challenges 
adversities, all the problems, all the questions, all the uncertainties. Trust it to his care today. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for revealing yourself to us. We know that you are a God of grace and love. And so, Lord, help us to learn to trust you with the details of our lives. So many things we don't understand. So many times, Lord, we just question you and we struggle. Help us to learn to trust you completely with our whole life. We pray for those who need to come and trust you with salvation this morning to receive the gift of eternal life. We pray for those who are carrying a heavy burden today that they would come and trust it to your care. Whatever our need, Lord, today, draw us near to you and have your way in our lives. In Christ's holy name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand and sing our hymn of invitation. I'll be waiting down front to pray with you, to receive you. Whatever need you may have, you come as God speaks to you. Come every soul by sin oppressed. There's mercy with
Thank you, Glenda and Vicki. That was wonderful. I want to remember our missionaries, Muche and Diamon Ukebu. <laughs> And I, I don't want any corrections on that one. It's actually from Miami, Florida. So we want to lift them up in our prayers. Remember that if you want to give uh, after worship, we've got baskets uh, by each of their exits. So be sure and, and share your gift with the Lord before you leave. And uh, hope that you'll join us for our midweek uh, Bible study and all of our services this Wednesday evening. And uh, it's good to see you all today. Hope you have a great week. Let's stand for our closing prayer together. Wayne Gain is going to come and lead us in our closing prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this gift of faith. Thank you for this encouraging message of faith, Lord. Uh, and we need it every day. And we praise you now, and Lord, we, we, we ask for your intervention in this nation and in our lives and in the world. As this pandemic uh, virus spreads, Lord, uh, there are all kind of efforts being made. But we know you have the power to intervene and slow it, stop it, whatever. Lord, we, we pray faith in faith that you will do that. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for our nation and for blessing our nation. And thank you by faith again that with the upcoming election that you will guide us with wisdom and leadership, Lord, to make the correct vote the way you would have us to do. And we know, Lord, that uh, in this world you're in charge and that uh, rulers and presidents and all of those people may come and go. But we're encouraged by your words from Isaiah that the grass withers and the flower fades, but your word stands forever. And we're encouraged by that. And Lord, also, you tell us that if we will wait and trust in you, that you will renew our strength and that we shall mount up with wings like eagles and that we shall run and not be weary. That she will walk, that we shall walk and not be faint. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that faith and that encouragement that we need. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.